for everyone. Uh, we'll start uh, ladies first on the end here. <laughs> uh, hi again, my name is Teresa Dowell Best. I'm the writer, director, producer of Genesis, uh, the Black Superior film. We saw the sneak peek up earlier today. My name is Donnie Lupard. I'm writer, director of a uh, web series, Osiris. Um, that's uh, one of several episodes that we have. They're all available online, OsirisTheSeries.com. Uh, my name is Tommy Bottoms. Um, I, my background is actually in spoken word. Um, recently just got into... <laughs> so, into lip sync. <laughs> you said spoken word. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> my, background, my background is actually in spoken word as far as uh, my artistic background. I got involved in the project by a good, with a good friend of mine, Malik Salam, who's the writer director of Eternal. Uh, this is, I'm probably, probably the newest person in filmmaking in this, but uh, happy to be here. Hi, my name is Bree Newsom. I'm the writer and director of uh, Wake. And just to plug real quick, I brought some posters and DVDs if anybody's interested. Uh, so <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Barnes, and I didn't have anything to do with any of the films that you just saw. <laughs> Uh, I'm a television writer of Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, Andromeda. I've written uh, novels for Star Trek and Star Wars and a bunch of other science fiction novels and mystery novels and stuff like that. So for some odd reason, they thought that it would be useful to have me here. So we'll, we'll see if they were right. All right, we're going to get right into questions. Um, this one, uh, whoever wants to jump in, we really would like to hear from all of you on this one. What makes a work of visual or literary art Black science fiction, fantasy, or horror? Does the hero have to be black, the main characters, the director or writer, or is it a combination of those elements? I, I would personally would say a combination of both. Um, I think you, as, a, as black people, we should be able to write stories and tell stories that, that necessarily are quote unquote black stories, but it's also good to incorporate the main characters and the, the heroes as uh, as the black characters or the you know as uh, showing our uh, perspective and our point of view and uh, our culture and our background and things like that in the storylines to a mainstream audience that might necessarily be a black audience anybody should be able to enjoy any of these stories regardless of your race or your background. Would anyone else like to jump in? Yeah. I, I think we're, we're seeing a trend right now, as a matter of fact, where um, people uh, are embracing a more diverse telling of stories. I think um, maybe not specifically science fiction, but Shonda Rhimes is a prime example of an African-American writer, producer, who's creating a body of work that transcends race. Mm -hmm. And um, truth be told, that's the work I strive to do. I would like. Um, to serve the people that groom and made me, um, certainly. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I would like to believe that my work is diverse enough for a broad audience to enjoy. Of course, I think that's the, that's the ambition of all of us sitting up here. Um, but to define it as black uh, today, um, I think is a celebration, certainly, but at the same time could be viewed as limiting. Um, if that's your goal, is to satisfy a certain demographic and that demographic only. I don't think we live in a time now where that's as viable as, say, the 70s during the black exploitation era, where that was pretty much how they made their money and their notoriety. Well, that's a valid point. Um, but I, I actually embrace the whole black science fiction thing or the black title because. Uh, for so many years, just like in um, uh, your short, I was the kid in the comic books and saying, where are the characters that look like me? And so that started me writing and writing stories. And um, so I know there's so many black nerds out there, you know what I mean, who just don't get represented. You see Comic Con, you see all the you know, fake, different colored faces, you know what I mean? But I feel like, um, to go back to the original question, I think, um, 
I think it, it has to be, because there's so many like filmmakers, like writers who don't tell the type of stories that they go support. Like you look at the top 20 grossing movies of all time, they're all like sci-fi or fantasy for the most part. And that's just not a Caucasian audience, that's every kind of audience. So, it's, so I ask the question often, if black people go see these movies, then how come we don't see more black filmmakers making these types of movies, writing these types of books and, and movies, et cetera? So where are they? Why aren't they, they support it, but they don't do it themselves? And so I feel like it, it, it should be classified as black, I think it should be more than just sprinkling a few black characters in the movie. I think a black filmmaker should put his voice out there and his, his perspective of the superhero movie, his or her perspective of the superhero movie or, or, or whatever, um, science fiction thriller or you know true blood type of storyline, you know what I mean? So and you put a new spin on it. So. Yes. The, uh, my esteemed panelists have dealt very, very well with one half of what the question was, which is the question of what makes it black science fiction, fantasy, or horror. But the question of the definition of what science fiction, fantasy, and horror is hasn't, you know, hasn't been covered. I thought it might be useful to touch directly on that since most of my background is as a science fiction writer. I've had a lot of opportunity to sit in the room with some of the biggest people in the field talking about just exactly what is this stuff. Um, to go kind of broadly, all fiction is fantasy because it didn't happen that way. But fa fantasy, the way we usually define fantasy is a what if proposition that utilizes magic of some kind to, to control the world and to knot the world together. So let's say vampires in, in, a, in a fantasy novel will exist simply because somebody says they're, you know, they rose from the dead and if you drive a stake through the heart and kill them and you show them a cross. So that's all fantasy. There's absolutely nothing about the, the universe as we understand it that relates to this. On the other hand, you can do vampire type stories in movies like, well, the original novel, I Am Legend, that was turned into uh, the Omega Man and then Will Smith's movie, I Am Legend, where it's this kind of a vampire situation, but it's a disease. So they're kind of trying to relate it to biology, the way we understand it. So you could say that science fiction is a subset of fantasy that has to obey the laws of, of science and the phenomenological universe and physics as we understand it, but you, they might let you break one rule. They might say, okay, we'll let you have time travel. If, if, if time travel exists, what might happen? We'll give you faster than light travel. You don't know, you don't have to explain it. Now tell us a story, you know, tell us a story that can only take place in a universe in which this is true. And all the other rules have to be consistent with the rules of science as we understand it. So that game of, of what if, it's like, the, the three basic questions of science fiction are considered to be what if, if only, and if this goes on. Okay. Now, horror is a different thing than that. Horror, it just talks about a type of story that is designed to create the dominant emotion of fear. So you can have science fiction horror, fantasy horror, psychological horror, any kind of thing, because what you're trying to generate is dread in the audience. Alien is science fiction horror. You know, Night of the Living Dead is fantasy horror, kind of, sort of. Okay. And Silence of the Lambs is psychological horror. So I just wanted to kind of lay down some definitions there. My, my partner faded off into the... Uh, all right. Um, how and why are black people negatively portrayed in the media? How do these images affect <laughs> <laughs> society? Because we don't just want to, you know, we know that we're portrayed, but how and, and, and why are we portrayed negatively? Oh, you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know you all got to talk. <laughs> I'm to make a nuisance of myself. I think, I think we're all trying to figure out how far back in history. <laughs> <laughs> because we're all trying to figure out, like I was thinking, I was like, 20th century, uh, back 17, like where do I start with that? Like, if we were starting right now, I would say it was because we wanted, we, we choose to be portrayed that way and we embrace it. I think if we were talking 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, it's something different. Um, so I don't know if you could say broadly, this is what it is, but right now, I think for whatever reason, as a culture, we've come to embrace these things as entertainment, and we're the ones who are the ones who, a lot of times, the ones putting out the negative images or the limited images of, of what we can be or, or how we can be portrayed. 
So I don't know if we can necessarily say we're talking right now, you know. Another time, even like the black exploitation film. I think I think in you know, there was a, there was a lot of backlash during that time at from certain certain black groups that those were negative, but they were trying if you look at the uh, like the Mac and um, what was the other one? Um, Shaft, Superfly. Uh, Superfly. <laughs> Even though they were drug dealers and pimps, it was always this kind of social conscious message behind it. it they were always this us against the man. They always won at the end. There was a positive image to it. Even though a lot of people might have said, well, oh, you're just paying, you're just portraying as drug dealers and pimps. But there was always the social consciousness along with it too. Um, and all the people behind the cameras were black, and which is another, the economics of it is, is, is another way to look at it too, not just the images, but you know, who's you know, feeding their families from it, not just the people in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. I think, I, I, think, I think what we're fighting against is stereotypes. You know, there's just certain social, it's not like the media exists separate from society, you know what I mean? So it's like there are certain stereotypes that still exist about the black community and we get those, you know, a lot of times I think what we run into as, as black filmmakers and anything dealing with blacks in media is when you put out something that contradicts those stereotypes, people question whether or not this is true. Like I hear that a lot, like for instance when the Cosby show came out, well that's not really how black people are, you know what I mean? So I think that's, that's part of what we're fighting. I don't even know that it's necessarily, I don't think people sit around and say, well, how do we negatively portray black people, well, as they certainly did at one point. But, you know, I mean, there was definitely a conscious effort at one point. But I, th but I think some of it is just combating uh, certain stereotypes. You know, I don't think that there was a, an attempt to portray black people negatively. I think that's how they actually felt. Hmm. I think they thought they were actually portraying us the way we are, actually giving that's good true. portrayals. Yeah. I mean, you know, with Gone with the Wind, they thought they were giving Butterfly McQueen and so forth an excellent role. They didn't understand what, what was going with that. I mean, when you ask why one group portrays another group negatively. You know, all I can ask, have you ever watched the way Hong Kong Kung Fu movies portray Japanese? I mean, it's like, you know, really, I mean, the, the idea of, of, any, of any group A portraying group B as being their equal is absurd. The, 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 the dominating mythology of every group of human beings in the world, with the possible exception of black Americans, is God made us first and loves us best. <laughs> and, I mean, you can't expect people to do anything other than that. That's how they roll. That's how everybody does as human beings. There's nothing easier than getting any group of people defined culturally to sit around and talk about how they're superior to whatever they're, they're defined in, in opposition to. So the, the, the reason why this has happened is that tendency plus a huge amount of guilt and fear related to slavery and reconstruction and, and you know so forth? They're waiting, in other words, when are they? When are we gonna? When are we gonna get get even? In <laughs> essence, I mean, there there really is a lot of fear around that because they know that if the position were reversed, they'd want to kill us. Okay, <laughs> they would. White people in the audience, come on, be honest, right? Right? You want to kill us, right? <laughs> so the the answer to all this is is. A couple of things. First of all, just more representation at the executive level, and you know, sitting in on the meetings and, and, and making comments and so forth, and waiting for the old gener older generation to die off. Quite frankly, I mean, time is going to take care of it. I mean, the fact is, it's one of the reasons I keep myself healthy because I'm just waiting for more of them to die. <laughs> well, I think I think um, I don't know. I you know I I I'm, I'm a person who is in the, uh, with the uh, let's blame media, let's blame, and white man, let's blame, whatever, because like Tommy said, I think a lot of people are, you know, it's, it's all about green I mean, at the end of the day, and, and like whenever I want to give myself a migraine headache, I just go to World Star Hip Hop, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, you laugh, but that's, that stuff is, that stuff is reality, like for the most part, it's either real, like somebody had a camera phone or whatever, they captured something that happened in reality. Or it was a music video that you know some guy with a uh, Canon 7D made, you know, in a marijuana smoke-filled, you know, dark room in their house while they, you know, they're on a uh, house arrest. So, so <laughs> like you know, and so and you look at those videos and they have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of views. But then you go to something that's more, you know, positive or uplifting or whatever, and it's got you know measly 400 views, if that. And so it's like the 
executive and look at those numbers, <coughs> and just, it's not a, you know, something they're manipulating. They look at those numbers and say, hey, this is what people want, apparently. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's a question of is art imitating life? Is life imitating art? Or what's going on there? And as content creators, we have to look at that sometimes and say, well, okay, do we give the people what they want or what they claim they want or what they or at least what they show that they want with their wallet? You know what I mean? Or do we just keep, you know, doing our thing? Um, so I struggle with that question in that the whole stereotypes things thing because in all honesty, some of the quote stereotypes you see in movies, there are people like that in my family. You know, and you go back home <laughs> in Detroit right now and see, you know, some people portraying in real life those stereotypes. <laughs> Um, I talk to a lot of black women who love that show Scandal. And I say, you know, Olivia Pope. Why do you look over here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I say, I say Olivia Pope is fictitious. But that woman, you know, screaming on the bus in that video on YouTube, she's real. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. Well, I would challenge her though, because Olivia Pope's not fictitious. You know, she's based on the actual. Well, I mean, just the series itself. Oh, it's okay, not a yeah. documentary or something. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, right now, with, with television in particular, I mean, we're seeing this trend of um, little to no representation on television, again, which is concerning to me, especially uh, just three nights ago. I remember um, watching, I don't know, I was kind of flipping through something, and I was thinking to myself, what happened to the time where at one point we had Cosby, Different World, um, sing, living single. I mean, it was like at one point we had this this menu of representation, and then suddenly all our hopes and dreams rest on the shoulder of Olivia Pope <laughs> right now. Um, and for better or for worse, there's a lot of there's a lot of dialogue about this black woman, this black character, at, as an adulteress, um, barking at you know. And at the same time, it's well, if she'd been portrayed by um, a, a white actress, will we be still having the same conversation? I mean, if you look at a show like Damages, and you have someone like Glenn Close who's portraying, you know, a, a, a damaged person herself, but no one, you know, <coughs> said a word about that. And I think a lot of times, um, right now, what we're seeing is that we're not. We're not putting our viewership, like you said, behind the quality. We're putting our viewership on um, user content, user-friendly based content like YouTube and um, I don't even know, what's the name of it? World Star, somebody. <laughs> I try to avoid it as best I can because the few things I've seen on it, I'm just like, wow. You know, I, I know I've been known to quote sweet, sweet brown myself. <laughs> but I happen to see today, as a matter of fact, she um, she's a spokesperson for local dentistry. Um, there's a dentist office that's using her as their spokesperson with gold fronts. And I just thought, wow. And then they showed the picture of the two dentists, and it's a white man and a white woman. And I, you know, it's just it's just damaging and hurtful. Um, we go through these waves of fight, struggle, complacency. Fight, struggle, complacency, I think. And right now, I think we're in an era of complacency. I think we're accepting whatever that's presented to us in, in general. And the one or two things that are tossed our way, we either <coughs> jump on it and embrace it or jump on it and criticize it, and there's no place in between. And I think we're seeing a lot of that right now. And then you have folks that are sitting here that are just like, you know what, I'm bucking the system, I'm putting it up myself, and that's what I'm just gonna do. And I think that's where true art and true storytelling rest now anywhere. I don't think we can look to the same places as commercial television and film um, for the answers or the images, quite frankly. Um, however, I had some really strong things to discuss about Django, but I guess we'll get to that later. I'd like to make one comment about, about um, Scandal. Sure. You know, one way I'd like to get across and that is, that they mentioned this at the Image Awards. It's been 40 years since there was a dramatic series starring a non-white, well, starring a black woman specifically. And in the history of network television, there have only been about four successful dramatic hour-long series with non-white stars. So every time you see one of those tons of comedies, almost no dramas, so I'm really pulling for that show oh, to absolutely. make it. It may be, you know, scandalous. But and this is where we're but funny, it's though. Here's where we're funny. 
we'll get behind scandal. I love scandal. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at my watch. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Folks are not willing to get behind deception the same way. Uh, right, exactly, your face, I love it. That's what it tells me everything. It's, it's NBC's answer, or, well, no, I take that back. I don't want to, you know, do NBC like that, but they have a, a dramatic show starring Megan Good. Better storyline. Huh? With a better storyline. Um, uh, that's debatable. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what I'm saying is, is that I've actually seen people in social networking uh, and, and, and Facebook and Twitter and different things actually discuss why they would get behind scandal with such a character as Olivia Pope as she is and not <coughs> get behind the FBI agent or the police agent that is depicted in, in uh, deception. And, well, you know, scandal, was, it was first. And scandal was, you know, and it's this idea that you can't support both, that you have to pick a camp. You're sitting here like doing an amen for the <laughs> Okay, I mean, if you don't mind me kind of tossing it to them, I mean, what's, what's your take on it? We want to go ahead and get a question from them, then we'll get a lot of Okay, my bad. All right. Well, I mean, that's okay. the thing, though. We're, you know, we have these, these opportunities to support solid shows, but then we, we also kind of pick them apart and pick and choose and become, the, um, have this divisive sort of thing about ourselves that won't allow us to embrace those sorts of shows right now. I'm kind of conflicted on the whole black industry because I, I would use, there was a time when I would be a, like really super sensitive about every kind of portrayal that there was of black people anywhere. And then when I started thinking about it uh, recently, I realized like I kind of long for the day when one black image doesn't have to be the representation of all black people. Because you know, that's like when you really reach freedom. Like if you think about it, like we don't sit around and discuss white characters. We don't discuss how a white a character in a film represents all white people. That's not even an issue. You know, it's just it's just not even something that that comes up, and that's just the difference between white privilege and <laughs> what, we, what we deal with. So it's it's kind of like on the one hand, I am really sensitive about the way that black people are portrayed, but on the other hand, I really long for a day where a black character doesn't have to be perfect; that they can have flaws. You know, like like that Olivia Pope can be this three dimensional flawed human being, and it doesn't have to reflect negatively on me as a black woman. I guess you know. Okay, we have um, our next question kind of um, segues into the Django statement that you made earlier. Okay, Django Unchained has created a stir in the movie industry. Um, what effect do you think it will have on, our, on the future of black films, if any at all? I, I will go ahead and go now. I've heard a lot of the criticism, and I, and, and I don't know what, I guess the main thing of what I used to hear is. Uh, know, Tarantino didn't have a right to tell this story, or he's not the person to tell the story. Um, I don't, I, th I think he's a, he's a creative person, he's a writer, um, and I feel as people who create content, um, if you think you can tell the story better, then, then just tell the story. You don't tell this man he can't do what he does. Um, a lot of people were offended by the language, I don't. I don't see how you can be offended by the word. Uh, I guess the word nigger. <gasps> <laughs> when, if, you, if, if, it, if it has this hold on us two hundred years later, then why not portray it from when the, the the time period it came out? You can't say N word during the slavery times. <laughs> it would not make sense. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I, I thought that I, there's some things that you know, if I want to be, you know, critique, you know, you could say. But you know, there were some, to me some historical inaccuracies. But other than that, I thought it was an entertaining, entertaining movie, and it's, it's particularly uh, Sam Jackson's character. <laughs> I, mean, I thought that was hilarious. You know what I'm saying? But that's me. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who thinks that they don't have permission to laugh, let me tell you something. I went to see it with my first karate instructor, who's now in his 70s. He was raised in Mississippi by his grandparents, who had been slaves. He was Louis Farrakhan's bodyguard. And he sat right next to me, laughing his ass off. <laughs> loved it. Absolutely loved it. Would give Quentin Tarantino a certificate of honorary negritude. Um, <laughs> What I want to say is, yeah, it's going to make a difference. It's going to do it in several different ways. Um, I'm, I do business with Reggie Hudlin, and Reggie and I, we were talking about uh, who's produced, uh, who produced Django. 
And he said there, there are maybe five directors in the world who could have made that movie, and four of them didn't want to do it. Okay, that when I love Django, and I think it's a work of art, I think it's a work of art the same way I think Mount Rushmore is a work of art. In other words, the, as a sculpture, it's not all that much. But you look at it and say, how did they do that? How did they get that thing made? When you look at something like Django, you hear of a movie that cost $100 million that is now making like $300 million, you know, heading toward $400 million worldwide um, because Quentin Tarantino is out of his mind. He's crazy. I mean, the guy, the guy is nuts. You can take a look at his other films. I knew that as soon as I saw Pulp Fiction. And there's that scene with Ving Rhames and the hillbilly that I was out of the room. And I'm laughing. And I'm saying, how did this guy do this? How did he make me laugh at that scene? I don't know how he does that. But the one thing I do know is he grew up around black people and knows black people. And if you're black and you grew up around white people or Mexicans or Asians, you can write about them. You can write about anything that you know that you've been around. He has the right to an opinion, and we have the right to dislike it. If, you know, slap it down. But the fact is, the artist has the right to represent reality. And men can write about women, and the straights can write about gays. I mean, it's, it's best to sit down with a member of that group and say, well, what do you think about this? And to his credit, Tarantino did. You know, whether it's with Reggie Hudlin, or Jamie Foxx, or Kerry Washington, or Sam Jackson. These things happen. That is, it, it is the job of an artist to represent reality from their, from their point of view. So can the movie be criticized? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I could give you chapter and verse on all the flaws and things could be done better and so forth. But it's a minor miracle that the thing got made. And it's going to make a difference because he, made, he, he gave jobs to a lot of people. He has, has raised the worldwide profile of Kerry Washington and Jamie Foxx. He's proven that movies with black stars, even though it's a Quentin Tarantino film, can make that kind of money overseas. And that's the only thing that people in Hollywood care about. Can I crunch the numbers and show where the dollar is? Okay. He has also created images that have not existed. No major studio has done a black western kind of thing. You know, they're, they're not very much of that's been done since Buck and the Preacher or something. You know, something like that. Okay. And and one thing that is 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 critical to to, to remember about that. When was the last time you saw a slave in a movie? Let me. I'm asking the room. When was the last time you saw a slave in a movie? Almost. There were no slaves in Amistad. They were free Africans oh, right. who had been captured, and the entire movie was about whether or not they were slaves. Come on, try again. What's the last time? <laughs> Beloved did not have slaves in it. It had ex-slaves in it. When was the last time you saw the thing itself depicted on the roots was a television show? It was not a movie. I mean, I, I literally don't know, but 10 years, 20, 30? I mean, it is, it is the third rail of cinema. And he went there, and he went directly there, and he made people laugh, and he made people think. And that de-inhibits the, the, the poison that's in there. So other filmmakers will be able to also present mm -hmm. images now. So I, you know, I, all I'm, I, like, I, want, I can't wait to shake his hand. And he did a good thing. It's not, per not a perfect thing. I understand why some people wouldn't like it. But I think it was a good thing and a brave thing. I thought the movie was amazing, quite frankly. The only other movie that, that gave me the feeling I had while watching Django was Rosewood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Yeah. It was that feeling of, OK, I, you know what? It is what it is. <laughs> Do it. I, I, grew, I was born and raised in Virginia. And Nat Turner, the story of Nat Turner is, is not folklore. It is history. That moment where that one person said, I can't do it, I can't take it anymore, and turned the weapons of the master in on themselves. Or that, that moment where you feel like the oppressed is having their moment, having their revenge, or having their victory, or having, you know, they're, they're winning in some way. And it doesn't have to be historically accurate as much as soul or spiritually serving. Yes. That's how I feel. Yeah. How I feel. I feel, I, I kind of feel bad right now. <laughs> I, Quentin Tarantino was the first filmmaker for me that did, he did something I think Spike Lee wish and I love Spike. I love the Spike camp, but it's it's it was that moment where I felt like in my DNA I was served. Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, 
And Rosewood gave me that because when we saw those people get on that train mm -hmm. and, and were getting out of there, after all of what they had been through, um, I just felt, I felt like I wanted to cheer. And I was surrounded by a bunch of white folks in the theater when I saw it in Canton. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't even know the movie was going to last that long in Canton. <laughs> and um, I was nervous at first because I sat there going, I can't celebrate. I can't be okay with him whipping the slave master with his own whip. But there was something in my spirit that just said, this is not about the movie. This is, this is a visceral sort of remembrance that I, I'm just going to have to embrace. And, I, and aside from being a filmmaker who could also, you know, say, hey, these are the things that we celebrate, and these are the things that are flawed, um, that movie just gave me an exhale, in a way, that I don't think I'd ever experienced with any other film. I'm just so glad I don't have to defend Django, because I've been doing it for so long. <laughs> I've been having so many arguments with filmmakers about this film, I was so glad that y'all just were on the same page, so I didn't even have to say that again, because I feel the exact, exact same way. And I felt, I I felt like, well, like, <laughs> in, in my space with other filmmakers, I really felt like the sticking point always came back to the fact that the director was Quentin Tarantino. And it was a white man who directed the film more than, we always ended up really just debating that and not a new content in the film. And I personally have a problem with that because I feel like if you say that any director, to say that he can't direct something because of, of his race means that I can't direct That's something right. because of my race or my gender, and I just refuse to accept that. I have a piece of information, and I don't know whether this is public, because sometimes you hear something someplace, you don't know whether or not it was in the media. But just in case this isn't widely known, there's a specific, it's a thing about Kerry Washington and Django. And this, the question was, we know that Quentin Tarantino makes kick-butt female characters. Mm -hmm. So why wasn't Broomhilda a kick-butt female character? Reggie Hudlin asked Quentin Tarantino that. And Quentin Tarantino said this, that black women have always had to protect themselves. Yes. They have always had to fight for themselves. They never had a hero to come and rescue him. Yes. Rescue him. And that's what he wanted to give them. Yeah, because I think what, when he opened the door, <laughs> Myself, but at that moment, all bets were off. <laughs> I think, um, go back to the original question. I think, and you know, not to counter you too much, I think the reason why it's not going to really change much is because we've seen this before. We've seen, you know, the, the movie with the black lead or the all black cast, whatever, be a big hit. And then you think, okay, this is a new wave coming and then nothing happens. I mean, how, you know, Will Smith is one of the biggest stars in the world, and we don't see a bunch of other Will Smiths, you know, he's pretty much it. That's all that will be accepted. Um, so I think, I think, while this the wave, the euphoria, as we see here on the panel, is still like fresh with people like, oh, this movie, and then the Academy Awards will kind of bump that up maybe a little bit more. But eventually, it will pass. Tarantino will move on to another type of movie. He won't be making all black films from here on out. And like you said, it took somebody of his stature to make this movie. It, it was a rare movie, as you said. It was a rare thing that this happened, so that's why I don't think it will we're, 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 we're change. Change. You're 100% right. right. But it is, it's like Barack Obama did not create the wave, he rode the wave, okay? Quentin Tarantino, what you're seeing is a whole bunch of different things happening. It's not that this one thing is going to click and suddenly we're all going to be holding hands singing We Are the World. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> but you, what you are going to see is like the black exploitation movies, the first few of them were pretty good. Cotton Comes to Harlem, and Shaft, and Superfly Squad. And then they, they got crap, and the crap movies drove out the good ones, just like counterfeit money drives out, drives out good money. But even though those black stars did not keep going, there were black people who worked behind the camera and got experience in writing, and, the, and those stars did small roles in other movies, and they set the ground for the next generation. We're no more than one generation away from, from uh, the, the kind of change. I've lived long enough to have seen so much change in that sense that I can see the, the points. I can see a whole bunch of different things that are happening. If you want to change, you guys are the ones that are in the position to make that change. The hope that you're looking for is right here. It's I not Tarantino or somebody else. It's you guys or nobody at all. I but think does Florida great... dictate also in terms of creativity? I mean, the fact that we have the internet, we have the tools for which to promote our movies with social media. I mean, does that not contribute even to our viewing habits, quite frankly, because I think a lot of people are saying, saying that we were moving away from movies, I mean, from TV 
stations or, or shows because we didn't see what we want to see. So now we're going online and looking at some of these things. I think, I think Excuse me a moment. Before, oh, before answer, I'm so sorry, but um, we're, we're going to have to wrap up. Okay. So, <laughs> we're out of time. so how about I give everyone one last chance to answer and then a big round of applause for everyone, and maybe we can continue the conversations out in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have shut down the joint. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. If you'd like to, if everyone would like to take a, a shot at the one last question. Well, I, I was just going to say, just to really kind of put those two points you made as far as um, there for 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 that for that for Hollywood or for corporations to make that change. Like you said, everything is a bottom dollar. But now that people have the opportunity to see this particular generation has the opportunity to, to, to see uh, content that doesn't have to go through Hollywood anymore, you have the right to choose because you have this thing I heard about called the internet that allows you <laughs> to really, you can really pick and choose what you really want to see. There's no excuse anymore. And, and Django's effect might not be seen in a year or two, but you will see these changes over a generation. And I think that sometimes we want to see immediate changes, immediate, we, we have to start thinking in 20 and 25 year down the line what it'll look like. And, you, and like you said, we're a generation away from that because you can only have so much um, negativity or poison that people will consume and eventually they will reject it and they'll look for something else. Um, you saw small bits of that when, the, when you had the hood movies, when everybody was kind of rejecting the hood movies, then you have the opposite extreme of things like best men where all everybody was a doctor and they worked out in the gym and you know it was just the complete opposite because people start rejecting the the typical straight video hood movie you know what i'm saying so in a generation we'll see a change speaking of the internet i want to remind everyone you can join the state of black science fiction on facebook and perhaps that would be another good place to continue these conversations i'm going to stop it right now <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much for